so we'll get started. Uh, I'm sure more folks will trickle in, and then we can adjust depending on. And given the audience, I want to make this more interactive, as in uh, Thomas and I uh, both work at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, he's a consulting engineer. I'm a product manager. Uh, so both of us have been working on our private cloud solutions. Thomas, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, Thomas Benoit, and I work for Palo Alto, uh, take care of uh, all the Europe uh, um, places for uh, all private cloud topics. So it includes uh, VMware NSX, ACI, uh, OpenStack, Contrail, Nuage Networks, all such kind of technology for uh, uh, SDDC. So we want to start off with the poll. Uh, so I don't know, have you guys tried the poll in the app before? Do you guys have the Palo Alto Networks app? So this was to make sure you guys are sitting in the right room, as well as for us to get more uh, useful data points uh, for structure in the conversation. So if you guys have the app, uh, please. Uh, Yeah, it should be right in the poll section. Okay. No, I'm, I'm getting some uh, data back, which is good. So we'll, uh, we'll look at this. But we can do a quick show of hands. Uh, so how many of you guys have NSX in production? I'm, I'm curious. Okay. And how many of you are running Palo Alto Networks VM series integration with NSX? Okay, so that's half of that, which is not bad. And how many of you guys have more than one vCenter or NSX manager? Okay, so we have the right people in the room. Uh, so the primary focus of this talk is going to be on the multi-NSX manager support that we introduced earlier in the year. And uh, we want to make sure that we can go through all the different reasons why we build that functionality, as well as how you guys can uh, build your designs around it, operationalize that in most of your data centers. And, and the feedback that we get in this room is typically what we've seen uh, with most of our NSX customers, as in around 50 to 60% of them have more than uh, one vCenter, one data center, multiple sites, which is why this functionality is very important. And then I'll go over uh, what are the components within Panorama and within the VM series which change because of the uh, multiple NSX manager uh, configurations. So this is how we will structure the talk. Uh, you know, we'll talk about what is the problem uh, and how we've approached the multiple NSX manager solution. We'll also talk about how you can now leverage a Panorama plugin for a lot of these uh, third-party integrations that we do, whether it's with VMware or AWS or Google or others. Uh, then we'll look at the popular use cases, um, and we'll touch upon each one of them. So Thomas is actually go, will go through each one of the, them in detail to explain um, how the multi-NSX manager solution is built. Uh, then we look at how the consolidation needs to happen, right? As in, for those of you who already deployed with multiple panoramas and multiple NSX managers, we need to have a mechanism by which the migration or the collapse can happen on the panorama side so that you can go from multiple panoramas to a single panorama. That is obviously a huge benefit from the um, consolidation and configuration standpoint. And then if, uh, we will end with the uh, VM series with SD1, right? As in, so uh, VMware acquired a company called VeloCloud, and we've built our integration with VeloCloud as well so that you can use a VM series, uh, the one on KVM in that instance, with the SD-WAN solution. So I'll end with that. So that's how we will structure the next uh, 45 minutes. So let's start uh, quickly on uh, you know, our journey or how we've progressed with uh, VM series over the last five years. So we started off in 2013. Start off with uh, ESX and NSX. And then you will see over a period of time, like Thomas indicated, there's a lot of work we've done with our SDN or networking partners, whether it is Nuage or Cisco or Open Contrail for different use cases, uh, data center, service provider, 
uh, both with ESX, KVM, OpenStack. So there's a lot of uh, functionality that we've introduced there. And then for NSX itself, you will see that you know, we added support for multi-tenancy, right? Because in data centers, that's a very common scenario where you have multiple tenants and you want to provision security for them. So that was uh, the key functionality that we added in 2016. In 2017, we added support for uh, panorama-driven workflow, right? Because most of our customers obviously are familiar with panorama and how they provision security there. So we added support for uh, panorama-driven workflows. And now in 2018, we've added support for um, multiple NSX managers with a single panorama. A couple of other additions, like I said, NSX SD1, as well as uh, on the hypervisor side, in addition to ESX KVM Hyper-V, we also added support for uh, Nutanix AHV. Uh, if you guys have any questions on any of the other topics, we'll be there at the end and we can, we can talk about it. So let's jump right in uh, to the primary focus of this talk. So like I started off earlier, as in the main problem uh, prior to this functionality in the Panorama plugin was essentially that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between NSX Manager and vCenter, right? For those of you who have been following, um, you know, how NSX has been built. And that then carried forward to Panorama, right? So one NSX Manager could talk to one vCenter, so you could have one Panorama then connected to that NSX Manager, right? So that's why all through the PanOS uh, 7.0, 7.1, and 8.0, that was the design. Uh, now, VMware introduced the support for uh, multi vCenter in NSX Manager. So that was one uh, forcing function, because once they did that, they had the whole notion of primary and secondary NSX managers. So that would allow you to manage multiple uh, vCenter environments. And uh, that meant that once you could have configure application with an NSX Manager, you still needed to have multiple panoramas talking to each one of them, right? So that was uh, the, the essence of the problem. And what does that mean from the security standpoint, right? From the security standpoint, what it means is you now need to have multiple panoramas, and you need to actually sync configurations between the different panoramas. So we had customers who were either doing this using their own scripts, or we had professional services uh, in the larger accounts who actually build scripts uh, to do that, right? So you could actually have an external script which would synchronize the multiple panoramas, but obviously that was suboptimal because we had to get that functionality into the product. This other key aspect um, is around how security groups are built in NSX and how they map into dynamic address groups, right? So there are specific identifiers uh, which come back from NSX which we use in our policy and they will be different, right? So if you have four NSX managers, and if you decide to have a dynamic address group for uh, your web VMs, then the individual identifier that you get from NSX manager one through four is gonna be different, which meant that the administrator then had to log in to all four panoramas, even if you had a web security group, and then change those parameters, right? So obviously that was uh, suboptimal. You really needed to make sure that you were provisioning these configurations consistently across multiple panoramas. And the third was a more interesting use case uh, which a few of our customers had. They were trying to build global policies um, and actually have these dynamic address groups span across multiple vCenters. So what it meant was that updates that they were getting for their virtual machines in one vCenter had to be actually sent to the VM series firewall, which is running uh, in the other vCenter, right? So we call it cross device group updates, uh, but that was something that was not available. So again, uh, our customers really wanted to have that functionality, had to do external scripting, use our APIs, and then make sure that they were passing that updates over, right? So that was the crux of the problem that we were trying to address there. And how we solved it, right? So the first thing that we did, uh, was we came up with the plugin architecture because it was becoming pretty clear that whatever functionality was specific to NSX was getting overloaded into Panorama, right? So we, we distinguished that, and once we did that, uh, we were able to use that uh, for multiple um, integrations that we do, whether it is with, uh, like I said earlier, AWS or GPCS or others. Um, the other thing that we did was we enabled within that Panorama plugin, 
uh, connectivity to multiple NSX managers, right? So whether it is a service manager aspect or whether it's a service definitions or any configuration within NSX manager, you can have up to 16 now. So that means that you can have a single panorama talk to 60, up to 16 NSX managers and whatever configurations or uh, dynamic updates that you get from virtual machines will be uniquely identified and you can also do cross device group updates so that VM series which is deployed in one vCenter, if you guys have a scale out architecture where you want to build a consistent policy, those IP updates can be sent across uh, multiple vCenters, right? So the, the, that's the key functionality that we introduced um, with this plugin. So uh, like I said earlier, the plugin architecture, what it gives us is essentially a quicker mechanism by which we can bring in functionality into Panorama. And then from a customer standpoint, as in 60 to 70% of our customers may not be using the NSX integration, right? So we want to make sure that the customers are using that, get the relevant functionality that they need, and they get it in a way which is more streamlined as well as the configurations are more in sync with what is needed for that particular integration. So it made more sense uh, to do that as a plugin, and, and we'll show that in the demo. Right, so essentially the plugin is something which is currently built by Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so like I said, uh, we built one for NSX and GPCS and AWS, so we build it internally, but in the future, we are looking at uh, opening it up, so if either customers or partners want to build specific plugins, then they can do that. Um, and like the rest of our software, it is downloadable from, uh, from the support portal. So you download the plugin, re-upload it back, you don't have any uh, software restarts or Panorama restarts, it's just going to take in the plugin and enable the new functionality. Uh, and the multi-NSX manager support uh, is now introduced in 2.0. So the first version of the plugin is uh, the functionality that we've had with single NSX manager, and with 2.0, uh, we've added support for multi-NSX, and a lot of the other functionality that you will see going forward is all going to be delivered from the plugin. Uh, so just to be clear, there are two modes of deployment here. Uh, and once Thomas goes through the use case, it will be clearer. But at a high level, think of two scenarios, right? In the first scenario, you have independent silos or you have different applications deployed on uh, vCenter 1 and vCenter 2. And instead of having two panoramas from a config simplification as well as, um, you know, having a single place where you can manage all your configurations, you will do it with a single panorama now. So everything will be independent, and um, you can just have a single panorama which is connecting to two NSX managers, and the entire integration is managed from there. The second and the more interesting use case is the cross vCenter, and that goes back to the um, cross vCenter support which is added in VMware NSX where you would have a primary NSX manager and a secondary NSX manager you could have vMotion between these uh, vCenters. You could also have disaster recovery, right? Uh, you have an active and a standby. So if one of the data centers or one of the vCenter goes down and all the applications move to the other side, then how is the config sync happening? So those are two options, and uh, Thomas will take it from here and go through it in detail. Yes. Thank you, Sidip. So uh, we're going to jump now in a video, uh, short videos to explain you uh, the integration and uh, the different use cases you're going to find with the, the plugin itself. One sec. Yeah. All right. So as soon as you will deploy the plugin, uh, and you will launch it. You will have few parameters to, to set up. And uh, the first thing that you will have to do is to specify, uh, in case of uh, multiple NSX manager, you will, to sp you will have to specify one service definition per site, so per uh, vCenter NSX manager types. So uh, just here, as you can see, uh, what we have done is uh, we just set up a name, uh, specify a device group, and uh, with, if you have to play and leverage uh, cross vCenter updates for uh, dynamic address groups, uh, it's a good idea to create uh, account uh, device groups and to create multiple different um, sub-device groups per 
uh, vCenter NSX Manager. It's exactly what we did here. We specify uh, one device group's uh, child for uh, seat A, and we did the same thing for seat B. Uh, we have created a template just to specify zones, just in case for, uh, uh, let's say, multi-tenancy support. Uh, it's a good uh, example. Uh, we specify here where to pick up uh, the VM envelope. So in, uh, in that example, it's a PanOS 8.0. But uh, you can easily run a PanOS 8.0 in one data center. And for another one, you can run another release of PanOS 8.1 or a different uh, size of VM. In that example, it's a 100. So it's just a matter of uh, how, how much throughput you can provide per data center. You can run 100, 300, or 500. And uh, the good option to notice here is uh, that we will leverage uh, the notified device group. So it means that all the... Um, Dynamic address group, so all the IP to DAG mapping we can collect from seat A, we're going to push things back to uh, the over data center on seat B. So thanks to that, we can cross vCenter updates for DAGs. So it's as simple as that. As you can see, we have two different uh, service manager profile because we have two different vCenter NSX manager, so you can and need to specify here uh, login, password, and, uh, and register on both sites. In f if we zoom here, as I mentioned before, you can see that there is a parent device group where we have hosted inside two child's group, one for seat A and what for one for seat B. We can have different out codes, so different licensing option per site. It's not a big deal. And this is exactly the uh, OS release of VM series we're going to run. You can use different ones. And this is exactly uh, all the OSXI hosts we have attached to a selected cluster. If we zoom now on the policy, we see that we have the global one for the parent uh, uh, device groups. And we're just going to create a simple uh, rules that allow uh, some traffic to the DB server. It will be an intra-zone security policy. We're going to select the device groups, so the workload where we want to, to, uh, to be able to connect to. And we're going to allow MySQL. So as you can see here, we have created that rules on uh, the parent device groups, and we push a policy. So because we have two child device groups inside that one, if we jump now into the uh, seat A, what we can see is that the newly created rules is already here. And if we jump into the other site, site B, it's exactly the same thing. So thanks to that new uh, release.2 plugin, you don't have to create a single unique rules per data center. You do it one time, and it will be replicated in every child um, device groups that you, you have attached to the parent one. So it will simplify a lot of management um, stuff. So just to notice here, but, oh, it ends, but. Uh, you can have up to uh, 16 different NSX manager defined uh, on, the, on the, that um, specific plugin. All right. So let's talk now about uh, that specific use case. If you run an active uh, passive uh, data center, um, the main goal here is to specify the config on Panorama. Um, in that example, we have different uh, web security groups and database security groups. And because it's an active passive, uh, only one data center is uh, active at the same time. So it means that we have all our resources right here. We can specify traffic between uh, security groups, and it will be allowed. If we uh, now generate a vMotion, or you just move from one data center to the other, there is nothing to do because the config is already synced up between the two data centers. So as soon as you will move your workloads, the traffic will be uh, allowed accordingly on the second data center as well. 
uh, it become more and more uh, common as well to, uh, to have not an active passive data center deployment, but an active active one. So it means that you're going to bring uh, L2 stretch between your two data center, and at some point, you're going to spread your workload between the two data center indifferently. So you will play with universal um, um, security groups, rules. Uh, you're going to use some uh, VXLAN uh, encapsulation uh, and transport zone across your data center. And it's something that is uh, uh, really important to, um, to, um, uh, to think about. Um, if you have two different uh, sites in ActiveActive, -Active, at some point, you can leverage native vCenter and, uh, and uh, VMware sync up capabilities uh, to replicate your uh, policies and objects between your two data centers. But the main problem is that uh, all the, uh, the knowledge that you can collect and grab from one data center is not necessarily pushed in terms of IP to security groups mapping to the other data center. So it means that if you spread some loads between the two uh, data centers, um, the resulting policy from that specific simple rule will be to allow some traffic right there. But for the other data center, if you have a rep machine here that wants to communicate to the database that is hosted on the other side, um, that specific data centers, we have no clue on the IP address that is hosted on that specific database security group. So it's exactly the reason why uh, we can now leverage Panorama to do that. With the cross v center capabilities, uh, you specified your security policy uh, directly into Panorama, leveraging exactly the same rules, Web2DB security rules. And locally, we can just grab all the information, so the IP to security groups mapping. We can collect things from that specific uh, site. We can um, retrieve exactly the same workloads IP address from that site, and we will merge all that information in Panorama. So thanks to that, by doing nothing, you can allow and spread that security policy across your two data centers indifferently. Nothing extra to do to set up. It will be done by default. So it will allow cross vCenter, vMotion, and, uh, and, um, and uh, configuration across your two data centers. So it's exactly what I'm going to show you here. On that specific demo, you will see that we have two um, independent uh, vCenter with uh, L2 stretch, and we will have a, a, a specific machine right here, and we're going to start a ping uh, to, um, to uh, one specific workload that is here. And what we're going to do is, uh, at the same time, we, we will just vMotion that specific workload from one data center to another. And what we will be able to see is that we will not lose any ping. The traffic will continue without touching anything. That one? Yep. yep. All right. So it's the active active scenario. So we will just create a specific rules, intrazone. As a source, I will use exactly the same uh, tenant, the same zone. It's an access to ping to my database and web server. So I just use a ping, ICMP, and SSH, for instance, I have created the rules here. OK. I will just commit and push my config to my both data center at the same time. So if I just uh, load the context of one of my virtual firewall on seat A, I can now see that my rule, is, my rule is allowed and created. And exactly the same rules have been pushed to my second data center. So we are, if I connect now into my seat A data center on that specific VM, and I'm going to start to ping one of my workloads that is hosted on the same data center. Because the traffic is uh, processed by the firewall on seat A, we see that we match the policy, and the firewall is on seat A. If now I start to vMotion my workload to the other data center, let's see um, how the traffic will continue to be managed. So as you can see, we do not lose any ping. 
during the vMotion process. The only thing that will change, if we had a look on the uh, uh, monitor tab for the log, you can see that now it's managed by uh, seat number B. So we vMotion the traffic, no service interruption, and all the VM series that have been hosted on the second data center have been processed to the, uh, the second data center. Let's move back here. OK. So now, another interesting use case is uh, for uh, most of the customer, you don't only use a production environment. At some point, you can benefit from production, pre-production, qualification, multi-tenancy deployment across one or multiple vCenter. So uh, what can be interesting to be able to do is to uh, create and test some specific rules that are not equally spread across all data center, but you can play and modify specific rules on a specific tenant and do not replicate those rules into the other tenant. So in that specific demo uh, video, you will see that um, we have two different vCenter, one primary and one secondary. We have exactly the same environment deployed. And what we're going to do is we will create a specific rule set for that specific uh, environment test uh, here to allow some uh, connectivity with an SSH connection. And we will push that policy only for that specific um, environment and not for the other one. Right. So because it's specific, it will be specific to that environment, let's try to create a specific rule set, not at the parent group level now, but directly into that specific environment. So we're going to create a specific rules in destination to my database server. And I will just allow SSH. Simple unique rules. And like before, we're going to push it. Now, as you can see, we do not push the security rule set in both data center, only on seat A. If we flip now to the second uh, site, B, as you can see, there is no specific rules to allow SSH. So now, if we uh, go back to the vCenter and we start creating an SSH connection to that specific database server, because of the rules we just created, the traffic will be allowed. No problem. Makes sense. And if we now change and flip to the second data center here, we're going to try exactly the same connection through SSH. And because there is no specific rules to allow it, in that specific case, the traffic will be blocked. So based on what we can and have seen before, you can create security rule set at the parent group level. It will be pushed back and sync up between the two data centers at the same time. But if you need to create some specific rule set for a specific data center, you can do it as well locally. So it's exactly what we wanted to, uh, to demonstrate in that specific video. So Sudip, you can go back here. I think I finished on my side. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so I'm, you know, those three demos should, uh, you know, indicate the three different use cases, and uh, you know how with a single panorama you get a lot of benefits with regards to both configure application, as well as sending the specific configurations to the relevant firewalls. Right. In the last, the DevOps use case was actually one of the primary drivers from a from a large. Uh, bank that we work with in the US, but because that's how they were separating their uh, vCenters, one for production and one for uh, staging and QA. And it was important for them to have a single provisioning mechanism 
uh, by which once their applications were being promoted, they would just switch the configurations from one device group to the other, and automatically once their applications were promoted into production, the relevant policies would kick in. Right? So a lot of the uh, cloud deployments, pre-provisioning of the firewall and the policy becomes very important. Uh, so that is one thing which has been enabled uh, with a single panorama being able to do that. Right? Once you have a single panorama, you can move configurations between device groups, or you can have separation, or you can also do things like hierarchy. As in device group hierarchy, which was introduced in um, 7.1, is another useful functionality. Because if you need to have consistent security across all V centers and then have specific policies on each one of them, uh, you can now enable that using uh, device group hierarchy. Right? So some of those are, are useful. So next, let's talk about, uh, you know, for those of you who already have multiple panoramas, how will the config migration look like, right? Because if you're consolidating from, uh, say, in this example, three panoramas to one panorama, uh, I'll quickly walk over uh, what the steps are. Uh, so the first thing, obviously, is uh, you need to plan this activity, as in it's not hitless, because you are moving configurations, and uh, we made sure that you don't need to redeploy the VM series firewalls, so that's a good thing. Uh, but do keep in mind that you need to do the backup of the configurations. You need to disconnect those three panoramas from three individual NSX managers and then point them to one. Uh, then you need to migrate the configurations, and then you just reconnect back. So I'll, I'll go over that uh, quickly. Uh, and again, you guys will have access to the slides, so I'm not going to go over each one of these. But these are the software versions which are needed uh, from the NSX side and from Palo Alto Network side uh, for the panorama, for the plugin, and for uh, the firewall versions. And some important things are, you know, all panoramas need to be running on the same uh, software version. And uh, like I said earlier, it's highly recommended that we do this in a maintenance window uh, because your security configurations uh, will be impacted on the firewalls when the uh, sync is happening. Um, another a few of these are nuances, uh, either from NSX side or from Panorama side, but you need to have unique names, right? You need to have unique names for service definitions, uh, for the managed devices, for the device groups, uh, for the zones that uh, Thomas was talking about earlier. Because obviously, if you have the same names and now you start to merge the configurations, then things will go uh, out of sync, right? So it's important uh, to change the names in those individual panoramas for all of these attributes. And the same for things like dynamic address groups, because now you will have uh, multiple uh, configurations within separate device groups. And because they're getting pushed to the same set of firewalls, there could be a conflict uh, if you don't build a unique mapping here. So let's see how uh, this will work. All right. So the most important aspect here is you need to identify which is the primary or the target panorama that you're going to use for your entire deployment. So we looked at a couple of options. One was to have you stand up a fifth or a fourth panorama in this example, but we did some optimization so that you can actually use one of the existing ones and then use that as a target. Right? So that basically means that the other two will collapse, and the target is the only panorama you will have once the migration is done successfully. So um, the first step is essentially logging into each one of these three panoramas and exporting the configurations. Right? So all of the configs are in XML. Uh, so once you export those, you will have them as XML files, which can then be re-imported somewhere else. But you will need to go to all three, export the configurations. Uh, and then this is new functionality that we added in the plugin, which is to actually disable the connection from Panorama to NSX Manager. You can use that for other debuggability purposes, wherein if you are either getting incorrect updates or if there are some software bugs because of which uh, you know, your uh, integration is impacted, you can just disable that, which essentially means that we'll temporarily disconnect Panorama from NSX Manager so that if there's any debugging that needs to happen on the NSX side or the Panorama side, you can just disable um, from Panorama. So once you do that, um, now this is the more important part where you have to copy the XML from the source panorama to the target panorama, right? And, and if you look at 
the XML in detail, you will see that you have the individual service definitions, you have the zones, you have the dynamic address groups, you have the security policies, you have the NAT policies. So all of these have to be merged uh, so that they can then be re-uploaded on the target panorama. Uh, so now that you have the merged config, you can then go into the target panorama and then import that specific file, right? So now that the target panorama will be the single panorama which will manage the uh, three NSX managers, that is the one which needs to have the aggregate policy. And at this point, you have options, like I was explaining earlier. If you do a flat configuration, as in a single device group, then you need to do all of this. But if you do a hierarchy, then you could even carve out some of the XML configuration to have the common policies in the parent device group and the vCenter specific policies in the child device groups. So that way you have flexibility that depending on your configuration, you can build it either way. Uh, so once that is done, uh, you need to now remember uh, on the firewalls, you'll have to map the firewalls in, uh, which were connected to panorama one and three so that the firewalls map to the right panorama and uh, connectivity is established. And once that is done, then the relevant service definitions in uh, the primary panorama or the target panorama have to now point to the relevant configurations on the NSX side. So once that is done, you will now have re-established connection from that uh, target panorama to all the NSX managers. So we'll stop for questions in the end, uh, but on any of these areas, if anybody had a couple of quick questions, we can, we can take them here. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good question. So, um, the, yeah. So the question was, uh, if you have a DR scenario and the primary panorama on the active site is down, then how will you manage this on the secondary side, correct? So in Panorama, we support HA. So you, in that deployment model, we recommend that you have the secondary Panorama on the second side, so that if when the primary, if you are actually bringing down the entire primary site, then the secondary Panorama will take over, and you need to make sure that all of the configurations are synced on the secondary Panorama. And for the NSX, there is an option by which you can um, sync all the dynamic updates for the VMs uh, to actually reach the second panorama. Once you do that, then you should be operationally. Yeah, so we have documentation which explains how the HA needs to be built and uh, how the IP updates need to be mapped once you move to the secondary panorama. We can, we can send you some links for that. Hello? Hello? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the demo, there was um, uh, uh, shown that uh, there was web and DB, and uh, there was something in the slide that say resulting policies, and only IP addresses were listed there. Is my assumption correct that um, uh, Panorama makes a uh, translation between um, names and uh, two IP addresses, and the, um, in the NSX manager, the resulting policies are only IP addresses? Yeah. Your, your object in Panorama is uh, only uh, an IP to uh, logically construct metadata in Panorama. Exactly in the same way that you have in NSX Manager, there is an IP mapping to a security group, tags, whatever. It kind of, uh, a lot of metadata that is available on NSX, and we just do uh, dynamic mappings between uh, that metadata that popped up in Panorama and the IP address that is attached to that metadata. So in NSX, it's IP mapped to a security groups or security tag. 
and it will be reflected back in Panorama as an IP mapped to a dynamic address group. And the only thing that we leverage on top of that is the notify device groups option to say, okay, does it make sense or not to push that IP information from seat A to seat B? It's, it's an option you have. It's not mandatory to do it. It just, uh, it can be useful if you want to do some cross V center, V motion, or uh, to move some workloads. It can make sense because you manage the security policy one time and it will be uh, push it back uh, to all your data centers. But it's IP to DAG, yeah. I'm talking with uh, some customers uh, who want to uh, use um, uh, the VM series to uh, protect only their key applications and uh, not for using it f um, uh, for all applications. And it's basically because of cost, uh, uh, the DLR in, 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 in VMware is uh, 10 gig or 20 gig or 40 gig, uh, depending on what, you're ha what you have. And uh, when you want to uh, route those kinds of uh, traffic to a VM series, then you pay a lot of money. So yeah. um, is it also us usable in, a, in such a hybrid model where the customer um, do, does some configuration in the panorama and some configuration in the NSX manager? The first thing you, you need to know is that the deployment is per cluster. So it means that if for a cost reason you want to spread the load between uh, non-sensitive, medium-sensitive, and highly sensitive, you can specify some cluster per, uh, where there is no... Uh, per e uh, ESX cluster? Yeah, okay, per yeah. ESXi cluster. Uh, because the deployment of the VM series agent must be consistent. The security policy will be exactly the same, push it back to every agent, and the VM series size will be the same per cluster. So if at some point you want to optimize the cost, I suggest you to... Uh, to select some clusters where you will push the VM series option and you can benefit from the security enforcement we discussed before. And for uh, the environment that is not as sensitive as the previous one, just go and leverage the distributed firewall, the native things from uh, uh, VMware, that can be an option. And if you don't even want to leverage the distributed firewall, you can also use another cluster when you push nothing. But it's per cluster. As soon as you will deploy the VM series, you will have a, a price in front of it, and it, it must be one OSXI host, uh, one VM series per OSXI host of that cluster. No other way to, to do things. And it's not uh, related to Palo Alto Networks. It's something that is as designed from the way uh, VMware deploy it, because it must be consistent in your cluster. OK, thank you. Thanks. Um, um, just a quick one. Um, does NSX deployment support scale out so that you can have several VMs per host? So we added support for that in 7.1. Uh, you could have up to uh, four service VMs per host, uh, but at that point of time, our, f our performance was around one and a half gig. So some of the customers are doing that, but now we can go up to five gig. So typically, we have not seen customers need more than five gig per host. Mm -hmm. um, so. In your scenario, do you think it will be more than five gig per host? Um, I don't think that the throughput is uh, the, the question here, but uh, in our case, there is a, the problem is limitation about how many um, uh, zones you can have, how many uh, tenants can you have on, on one cluster. Okay. So in that case, um, maybe we yeah. could go with a smaller uh, VM and maybe scale out with several yeah. of them. Yeah, so we now support up to VM 100. Uh -huh. um, so VM 100 is also supported in the NSX integration. In the future, we'll also look at VM 50. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're trying to do that with smaller VMs, yes, that's an option. Uh, you can do up to four service VMs per host. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, this has been a common ask from our customers on the certification. VMware has a certification for NSX. Uh, we are now fully certified, and we publish the matrix on both sides, and we try to do it uh, one, as in one to two months within the PanOS releases so that uh, you know customers get full support from VMware and uh, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so at this time, again, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on a quick poll, uh, primarily because NSXT is uh, you know, the next version uh, or the next generation NSX uh, that um, VMware is building, and we are working closely with them on that. But I, I was very curious to know, what are your plans in 2019? Right? As in how are you guys approaching? Um, your integrations or your solutions with NSX. So if you guys can use a minute or so and uh, a 
upload this in the app, I would appreciate it. You could also do it, Sa, you can do it after the session as well, right? The poll, yeah. So then in the interest of time, I think you can, get, uh, can do it after the session, but I would, uh, we would be very interested, or a quick show of hands of how many of you guys are already looking at uh, NSX transformers? Okay. And is that for the on-prem use case or for the VMC in AWS use case? Any, anyone from VMC in AWS? Okay. And the rest I'm assuming is all on-prem? And at that point, you're going to just cut over from NSX V to NSX T? Yeah, right from uh, NSX V to NSX T. Uh, Got it. Yeah. So please reach out to Thomas and me, as in uh, we are um, definitely looking at NSXT very closely to see what are the optimal integration points. So we would be very interested in having uh, upfront discussions. Yeah. Uh, so we should catch up after the session. So uh, I'll spend a few minutes on SD-WAN. Uh, this is another offering from NSX. Uh, obviously, SD-WAN is a technology which has been around for uh, three to four years now and gaining a lot of attention uh, in the remote office, branch office scenario. Primarily because you know you can go away from your static routing configurations and dynamically use uh, either MPLS or, or a broadband or a 4G connection, depending on where your traffic is destined, right? As in, with more and more uh, SaaS and IS cloud-based applications, the flow from a remote office branch office is not just to a data center, which could use a dedicated MPLS link in the past, but you now have different outbound paths, uh, so you can intelligently use. Uh, any transport, and that is what SD-WAN enables. Now, from our standpoint, what it means is that we can now more effect effectively provide security for these branch locations uh, by partnering with some of these SD-WAN vendors. So the first one that we are partnering with uh, for the VM series is VeloCloud. Uh, and there are two options, as in some of our customers are using our Global Project Cloud service, uh, which also has some of these integrations. What I'll talk about is uh, how we are integrating VM series uh, on the SD-WAN appliance, right? So think of it as every remote um, office or a branch office uh, for a bank, for instance, uh, having a single SD-WAN appliance for all the traffic which is leaving the branch. And at that point, you will uh, have a, a zone separation between whatever is coming from the van to the LAN and whatever is going from the LAN to the van, right? So, you can create simple zone configuration on that VM series firewall, and it gives you complete visibility uh, to, uh, to be able to apply policies for that specific branch. Uh, the other advantage is uh, if you also have, say, the NSX integration or you have physical or uh, virtual firewalls in a data center, uh, you can use a panorama to manage the policies for the data center and for the branch, um, and then all the configurations for the branch will be pushed to the VM series on that SD-WAN appliance itself, right? So the co-location uh, gives you a lot of benefits. Uh, in terms of orchestration, it's um, kind of similar to the NSX integration, but it's not all orchestrated from Panorama, uh, because in the NSX integration, you have one VM series per host. Uh, in this case, you typically will have one per branch, so the orchestration is done uh, by the um, NFV Edge device, which VeloCloud has, and the VMs are then automatically spun up, and then they are provisioned automatically uh, with the VM series talking to our license server and all of the bootstrapping happening locally uh, on that VM series. And then the VM series will connect to Panorama over the SD-WAN overlay, and the policies will then again be automatically downloaded. Right? So the automation for policy is very similar to what we do with NSX, uh, but the flow is different uh, because instead of having an NSX manager, you have a SD-WAN Edge and the orchestrator, which are going to be the components uh, which will manage the firewall deployment. And there are two models of uh, the SD-WAN Edge that we support. Uh, one is called the Edge 520V, which is the lower end, uh, and this is the configuration for it. Typically, they are used for around 100 Mbps circuit from each branch. Uh, so for those, uh, we think VM50 will suffice. Uh, so VM50 is the one which is standardized on that, and the larger one is Edge 840, uh, which can do up to 500 Mbps uh, and has up to 32 GB RAM. You can use the uh, VM100, uh, 
uh, in that deployment, right? So those are the two. And now this is fully certified and uh, supported by Palo Alto Networks and, NS and uh, NSX SD-WAN uh, teams. So this is another uh, option that you have for your remote office branch office. So I know we took a couple of questions. We have uh, maybe a minute or two left. Anything else, uh, any other questions that we can help answer? OK. Yeah. How can this default uh, deny rule can be overcome? So if if you can um, delete it or modify it via Panorama, because the the problem is that the the, the logging log forwarding is not enabled. So you would want to see on Panorama what's being dropped. But uh, in this case, you can only put the, the the new policy above. But in that case, you you lose the post um, post security policy rule base. So what can you do in this case? Because if I understand correctly, you, uh, the, the bootstrapping is not supported on NS6 um, series, or am I wrong? So that's a good question. Uh, so I'll kind of rephrase. Uh, so one was, uh, if you know, for folks who have looked at the NSX integration, there's a default uh, deny rule. The reason why we had added that was that when the firewalls come up, there was a time window between which the guest VMs would start talking and we want to make sure that everything is, is denied. So that is the reason why it was added. Uh, we are trying to look at means by which we can provide an option within Panorama so that for customers who don't want that default deny, we can uh, flag it from the Panorama plugin. So we are looking into it, and uh, you know, we can definitely have an update uh, once we fix that. Uh, could you repeat okay. a second question? Um, and the second question is, uh, what's the recommended way to, to, for upgrading the, the NS6 VMs? So it's to put the, the host in the maintenance or or bypass the traffic for the meantime? Yeah, so that's a good question. I don't know, Thomas, we want to take that? or No, no, go okay. ahead. Okay. So the, the second question was that what is the best way to upgrade the firewalls in the uh, NSX deployment? Uh, so there are a couple of ways to do that, as in you can um, do it from NSX manager, in which case the service VMs are redeployed. The benefit there is that it will be done in a staged way so that they will bring one host down and then uh, the VM series will be updated on that host. Uh, the flip side is that the entire VM is redeployed. On the Panorama side, it's a software update. So it doesn't require any redeployment of the VMs, but the traffic will be impacted for that period of time. So most of our customers then do a V motion from that host to another host and then invoke the upgrade uh, from Panorama. Or you just remove <coughs> the serial rules policy, mm -hmm. upgrade your VMs, and push it back. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sessions are sync up and maintained at the distributed firewall level. Mm -hmm. As soon as you remove the serial rules policy, you just wait that there is no more session on the firewall itself. And when it's OK, you upgrade your firewall, and you push it back your serial rules policy. So for the existing session, it will be continued to be processed by the distributed firewall. And for new session that will be established, it will be back to normal. It's another way, but yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're pretty much out of time. I can take one more question if um, anybody else had. OK, thanks, uh, thanks for your time. And thank uh, you, you can.